Well, today is a big day, and you know we got two birthdays today. It's Palm Sunday, and I hear that's also our anniversary, our first year anniversary. Yeah, being in this church, so yeah. So I'm excited about what the Lord's going to do this next year. And so let's pray uh, for this year and for this message today. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, uh, for just a, such a full day. And thank you, God, for being with us. I just pray that you would just have your Holy Spirit fall in this place, God. We just welcome you in this place. We lift our hands to you. We lift our hearts to you, God. We just ask that you just anoint my tongue, God, that I would speak everything that you want me to say, God. Nothing more, nothing less. I thank you, Father, that you have given me a word, and I pray that it will be all of you. I just pray that your people's hearts would be ready to take it in, ready to just take the seed and let it grow. And I just pray that you would just water it, God, with your word, and that they would continue to grow strong in you. I thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you that we've been here for a year, God, in this new building. Thank you for this church body. I pray that you would just continue to do great things, that we would grow, God, that we wouldn't stay stagnant, that we wouldn't be apathetic, but that we would grow this year and grow in everything that you want us to. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. So about a week and a half ago, my dad was talking about us going to the pastor's conference the Pastors and Leaders Conference. But God really spoke to me through that. He spoke to me through this one phrase that this pastor said. He said, to be a holy risk taker. And that wasn't like the main theme or anything, but that just really stuck out to me. And first of all, I was like, yeah, that's good. But then I was like, no, it's not good to take risks. It's not, it's not good because you might fail. But that, that's when I realized that that was my perfectionist mindset rising up within me and so since I've been a perfectionist at times I believe the lie of the enemy that if you can't do things right the first time then don't even do it at all and so that statement is sure crippling I don't know if any of you have ever thought kind of like that but it really cripples you and it makes you not want to do the will of God because you're afraid to you're afraid to step out and so just think about people who are successful. You know, it could be in the world or the Bible, but all these people, what do they do? They have to take the risk unless they can't grow. So if we take the risk, then we will grow. And like we were talking about this morning in prayer, we want to be that church who grows because we have another year ahead of us. We don't want to just stay the same because that's not what the Lord wants for us either. So the title of today's message is Risk the Ocean. And Tim Hawkins, I don't know, how many of you guys know Tim Hawkins? He's a Christian comedian. Yeah, we watched him here a couple times. But I remember in one of his videos, he was talking about how parents always say, when you leave, they say, drive careful. And then Tim Hawkins is like, duh, what are they going to say? Drive fast and take chances. Or cut people off, sweet pea. Or use road rage if you have to. But I'm not saying that we need to do that. We don't need to take senseless risk. I'm just realizing that taking risk for me is just stepping out in faith. And I've been so afraid of failure in the past that stopped me from doing a lot for the kingdom of God. So to break that in me and to break that in you guys, we need to know that we are loved by God. And I don't know if how many of you were here for my last message, but... I was talking about knowing our identity in Christ. And once we know that, we'll have confidence to do his will without fearing rejection or failure. I like how the pastor at the conference said it. He also said to take aggressive steps of faith. I believe that now is the time that we need to step out and risk the ocean. And just like that song we were singing, because it's cool about that song, actually, because this week... You know, the Lord put that on my heart, oceans, and then he put it on the hearts of some of you guys. You guys were telling me to, that you felt like the Lord wanted us to play that song. And as I was thinking about the topic of my sermon, I realized that it fit perfectly with the song about stepping out onto the ocean. And I like how Hillsong titled it. They said, 
they title it Oceans, but they also put in parentheses where feet may fail. And that just shows that there is risk, that if you, if you don't have faith and you do doubt, then there is risk. You might step out in the ocean, and if you do doubt, you will sink. But that's why we need to have that faith. So that brings us to our text this morning about Peter stepping out onto the water. And if you haven't already guessed, our text for today comes from Matthew 14, where Jesus walks on water, and then uh, Peter does so afterward. So those of you who already know the story about Peter, you guys may be saying, well, Peter failed, so why are you speaking on this? But realize that he had faith to step out, and he did walk on the water for a second. I don't, I don't really know how long he did, but he did. <laughs> and that's what I want to focus on. And I believe that the major growing time for Peter was spiritually because once he stepped out in faith, I think he grew the most out of all those disciples. All of them grew, but Peter learned the most because he stepped out in faith and the Lord saved him, and then he could look back on that time. So last time I spoke, we took a look at Peter, and we're taking a look at him again and his life with Jesus, but we focused on his identity in Christ. And first, before he was Peter, what was his name before Peter? Simon, Simon yeah. And Simon meant shifting sand. And then the Lord named him Cephas, or Peter, which meant the rock. And so we saw Peter mature and change from sand, you know, where you don't want to build a house, to rock where you want to build a house because it's solid, it's firm. And so he's a pretty relatable guy. He puts his foot in his mouth a lot of times, like I do, like you guys do. And yet Jesus was always faithful to him. And I've heard people say, my dad's told me that people believe there's different groups of disciples. There's the 70, I don't know who's all in the 70, but then there's the 12, which we always talk about. And then there's the three, Peter, James, and John. And then there's even one more people think, which is the one, which is Peter. And so I believe that Peter was the closest to Jesus out of the disciples because, as my dad says, he wanted to be. Peter took risks in the name of Jesus. Even though he messed up at times, he was able to do things that other apostles are not recorded doing. In our passage today, we will see an example of him stepping out in faith in the middle of a storm when no one else would. So if you have your Bibles today, please turn with me to Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. You guys there? Yep. All right, so Jesus walks on the water. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. Verse 23, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Verse 24, but the boat by this time was a long way away, long way from the land, beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. Verse 25, And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. Verse 26, But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Verse 27, But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Verse 28, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Verse 32, and when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So, before we take apart this text today, I want to go back to the context of this miracle. And as it's Palm Sunday, we know that Jesus came, like as Mara was saying, on a donkey, and they put palms on the road and cloaks and stuff. And so that's why we call it Palm Sunday. But he was riding in, and everyone was 
celebrating because they thought he was the king that they were waiting for for hundreds of years. And Jesus is the king, but he's not the king that they thought. He's a, he was here to bring the kingdom of God. And that was very different than what they thought. So the disciples got to see this firsthand. He, they were with Jesus. They saw him cast out demons by now. They saw him heal the sick. They saw him go into camps of lepers and when no one else would want to go around them because it's so they can catch it easily. So he went there and he would cleanse lepers. He would raise the dead. And, and right before this miracle, he saw them feed, oh, they saw him feed 5,000 people. And that's just counting the men. So most people think that would be 20,000 people. And so that's a lot. And not only that, but there's 12 baskets left over. And that could bring us into a whole other sermon about the abundance of God and how he always provides more. But even though it was a huge miracle, the Bible says in Mark 6.52 that the disciples didn't understand the significance of it because their hearts were too hard to take it in. Now we can be quick to judge the disciples, but let's not because our hearts are hard at times and the disciples didn't have the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. But just think how many times we fail to recognize God's work in our lives. You know, we probably, we probably can think of some times where we think back, we're like, wow, that was God. And I didn't even notice it. I didn't even take the hint at the time. So after this miracle, Jesus immediately made his disciples get into the boat and head to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he was dismissing the crowds. And since the disciples didn't truly realize who Jesus was yet, we see him about to do another miracle to teach his disciples something new about himself. So just a quick little fact for you, fun fact for you. Um, the Sea of Galilee, I heard that it's not really a sea. It's more like a large lake. So I don't know what the difference is between that. But <laughs> yeah, for those of you who want to know. But as his disciples were tra traveling across that lake, Jesus went up to a mountainside to pray. And I love how Jesus always snuck away from people. Not, he was a people person. He, he healed people, and he was around people all the time. But he still took that time to sneak away and to spend that time with his heavenly dad. And if Jesus is doing this, how much more do we need to do this? Because he's Jesus, and we, we need the Lord so much more, I believe. And so, even though he was busy, I, I imagine, like, if Jesus was here today, there would be so much paparazzi and stuff around him. <laughs> they had cameras back then. But he still found time to pray to his Father in heaven and to spend that time just one-on-one -on -one with the Father. So, after Jesus had been alone with the Father for a while, and when the boat was a long way from the land, a storm started pounding on the disciples' boat. And the cool thing is that Jesus sent them into that storm. And you guys might be like, why is that cool? That doesn't sound cool. But it's cool because he knew that storm was coming. He knew he sent them into a storm. And it wasn't just to destroy them or hurt them, but it was to teach them something. He sent them into the heart of it for a reason. In Luke, it's recorded that disciples had rowed about three or four miles out by now. And, but then in Mark, it says that the Lord could still see them. And he saw that they were making headway painfully. So what did he do? Well, since the disciples had already took in, taken the boat, he didn't have a boat or a jet ski or anything. So he just walked, he walked across the water just in their time of need. And it's funny how people say, oh, God would never violate the laws of nature. Well, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think this is, I think this is violating the laws of nature, <laughs> walking on water, because it's not supposed to hold humans like that. But notice how the water treated Jesus differently than it treated the disciples. The disciples were trying to row across this lake, and they were, having, they were struggling. They were having a hard time, yet Jesus is just walking on top of the water, coming out to them. And earlier in Matthew 8, the disciples saw Jesus calm the storm with one word. It says in verse 27 of Matthew 8, what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? So calming the storm is one thing, but 
when his disciples saw him walking on water, I could just imagine them saying, well, he calmed the storm, but now he's walking on water. This is truly amazing. This guy is, this guy is awesome. But at first, this is not what they did. We see that when the disciples saw the figure on the water, they were terrified. They're saying, it's a ghost. And then the Bible says that they cried out in fear. But immediately, what did Jesus say? He said, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And I just like how he says, do not be afraid. He doesn't say, don't be afraid, but do not. I think that's so much more powerful when you just take out that apostrophe, separate the words, and say, do not. But that's a lot of background stuff. So this is where my message really starts. I know it's been long getting here, but (laughs) bear with me. So it starts right here where Jesus says, take heart. Do not be afraid. So if we want to be men and women who draw near to Jesus, then we need to be listening for when he speaks. So that's our first point for this morning, is listen for when he speaks. Would you guys say that with me? Listen for when he speaks. I'm going to have you guys repeat to keep you awake and stuff. (laughs) But this is an important point because the Lord is speaking all the time, right? And the question is, are we listening? So we need to learn to develop that listening ear like Peter did. Peter was quite a unique man. Maybe that's why I keep speaking about him. But many of you have probably noticed that Peter was the boldest of all disciples. Has anyone noticed that? Yeah. But he was the one who would say what people wouldn't say. You know, he would just say what people were thinking. And then he would do what people would never have the nerve to do. And that takes us to our second point. And these points are going to go fast because there's seven. And I chose seven because it's a good number. <laughs> number of completion. But that takes us to our second point, which is respond to his voice. Say that with me. Respond to his voice. So once Peter heard Jesus' voice, he listened, and then he responded. Our problem at times is that we listen and that we don't respond, or we respond without even listening. And so either way you take it, you need both of them. You can't just do one or the other. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. From my viewpoint in the past, I might say, wait, Peter can't just tell Jesus what to do. But Peter is really asking. He wants to know if it's truly Jesus. And if it is, he wants to just be with Jesus. He wants to walk across the water and meet with him. Which brings us to our third point, ask to be invited. You see, Peter was invited on the water because he asked Jesus to command him to come. He asked for that rhema word that we've been talking about that rhema word from Jesus to step out in faith. And our problem in this area a lot of times, or I see this in my life, is that we don't invite ourselves. I feel like I don't really invite myself most of the time. Or you can be the one to just invite yourself on your own. And hopefully the majority of us know that it's not, that's not polite to just invite yourself to people's parties and stuff. And if, you're, if you don't think that's a problem, maybe you're the one doing it, and people don't really like that. But anyways, just think of Peter. If he invited himself on the water without asking Jesus to command him to come, what would happen? He would just jump out of the boat with his clothes on, and his disciples would think he's crazy. Maybe they already did think he's crazy. But, you know, he, he would just make a fool out of himself because the Lord did not say come. And so... When Peter did walk on the water, notice that he got the command. He got that rhema word to come on the water. And that rhema word, as we know, it's not the written word. It's not what's written in the Bible, but it's a spoken command from Jesus. And we can get that rhema word from the Holy Spirit that speaks to our heart. And in order to have faith to do something with that rhema word, we need to take that leap of faith. You know, we need that, sorry, we need that rhema word first before we could take the leap of faith. I mean, how many people have you heard try to walk on water? I mean, I've tried before when I was younger, <laughs> just in the pool. I tried to run across the water. But it never really works because we haven't gotten that rainbow of word from God. You know, we're just doing it to show off or just to be cool or have fun. But that's not why Peter did it. He did it to be with Jesus. And then Jesus wanted to teach his disciples a lesson, teach him something new about himself. 
So we need both those things. We need the rhema word and the faith. And once Peter's faith was overcome by the wind and the waves, what happened? He sunk. So in our lives, when we get that rhema word from the Holy Spirit, then we need to hang on to that. We need to have faith all the way through. So that because God, once he gives us that rain reward, he will pull us through. It's just a matter of our faith from then on. And what's cool is once that rain reward was spoken, Peter's faith came into play and then the water came hard. It, Jesus didn't just make the water hard before him. And then Peter saw it, it looked like glass or something and started walking on it. No, I believe that he saw the waves whipping, and, you know, it just looked all shaky, yet he still stepped out in faith. And from what I hear, Peter is probably a pretty large fisherman, and some refer to him as the giant, actually. And historical writings confirm that he was a man of good size. So personally, I think that stepping out on the water for him would be harder than You know, for my little sister, Trinity, who's like 60 pounds or something, or seven, I don't know. But I feel like it would take more faith for a bigger man to to step out on the water. And I like working out with my brother, and guys think, you know, big muscles are cool and stuff, and, you know, it's tough. But people portray Jesus as a weakling sometimes, or like a wimp, like in paintings and stuff. He just looks all, all stringy, and just, he looks really... He looks really wimpy how people portray him, but he was a carpenter. And before the days of power tools and lumber yards and stuff, he's the one who has to chop down the trees and carry the lumber himself. So that's even before he starts the building process. So I I believe that Jesus was pretty big because, not big, but strong, because he could pull this waterlogged Peter, this big fisherman out of the boat, out of the water single-handedly. And so that's just a guy's note, so write that down, guys. But <laughs> looking, let's look back at being invited. If you have been like me in the past, and if you have struggled with perfectionism or apathy or something to that effect that's crippled you, then most of the time you see that you've never really asked to be invited. You've never really stepped out because you're afraid to do that or you just don't really care. And we have been like the disciples at times. We've just sat in the boat. And just watch someone else step out in faith and get a second or two on the water. I mean, why did Jesus only invite Peter onto the water? It wasn't because Jesus just liked Peter better and Peter was just the chosen one. But no, it's because Peter asked to be invited. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one and to the one who knocks it will be open. So the Lord is always ready for you to ask. I want you guys to think to yourself for a moment. Do you think you're more like Peter, ready to step out of the boat and let God use you? Or are you more like the other disciples who just sit in the boat watching other people, or watching pe- what happens to Peter? I'll just give you a moment to think about that. But that was a quick moment. (laughs) But like we just read about asking, seeking, and knocking, the Bible says that it's right to ask God for those opportunities. And it's kind of cool how asking, seeking, and knocking, uh, the first letters of each of those words spell ask. So it's important to ask. We need to ask God, and he will respond to us if we really want to hear his voice. Knowing Peter, it's no surprise that he asked for an opportunity to walk out the boat and be with Jesus. And that brings us to our fourth point, which is to be completely drawn to Jesus. So say that with me. Be completely drawn to Jesus. People like Peter are ones who want to follow Jesus with all their heart. When we purpose in our heart to be completely drawn to him, then we'll develop that boldness which comes by the Holy Spirit. It's that kind of boldness that says, like Peter, Lord, it's dark, it's stormy, I see the waves are crashing, and it's hard to focus, but I have faith in you to step out onto those waves and come to you, God. At that moment, Peter didn't have to worry about the wind. He didn't have to worry about the waves or the storm around him. 
he knew that Jesus would never fail him and never let him down because, why? He loved him. And so your faith will be strong as long as you keep your eyes on Jesus. We know that Jesus has the power over all things. So is there anything that our God cannot do? No, there's nothing. Well, he can do everything. I'm going to confuse myself if I say there's nothing that he cannot do. But there you go. I said it. But not only does he have all power, but he loves you. He loves you enough to die for you and to sacrifice it all so that you guys might be saved, so that I might be saved. And when we know that, when we know that he has the power over everything and that he loves us with an everlasting love, I believe that that will make our faith strong. But we need to believe that within our hearts because it is true. God, God has been faithful to us. He has loved us, and he always is strong. It's just, are we going to believe that? So following with the story, before long, Peter took his eyes off Jesus. If you guys look at verses 30 and 31, it says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So it was when Peter saw the wind that he sunk. Once his focus was turned to the things around him, he wasn't able to stand on the water anymore. And when Peter looked around at the wind and the waves, doubt began, began to fill his heart. And he began to doubt if Jesus really was more powerful than the wind and the waves. It's interesting that the Bible refers to the man who doubts as a wave tossed in the sea. That's found in James 1, 6, and I'll read it to you. It says, But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So as soon as we let that doubt flood our heart, the water, the water that was once hard under our feet can't support us anymore. It won't support us anymore. So instead, we'll sink down into the water, and then we're, we'll be tossed by the waves and it is interesting, I never saw this until I studied this, that Peter literally became like a wave tossed in the sea. You know, that verse, he really exemplified that verse. And, and I really like that verse because it also starts out with, let him ask in faith. And we were talking about asking to be invited. So that, that's a good verse for this passage. But did anything change about Jesus that made Peter sink? <laughs> No, nothing changed about Jesus. It was on Peter's end. That's what changed. And sure, the storm was more powerful than Peter, but in the storms that we face, we must remember that nothing is more powerful than Jesus. When we believe that, then everything around us, nothing has to be a threat to us. When Peter believed that in the beginning, the stormy water was not a problem to walk on. He could do it fine. But once he looked around and began to doubt if Jesus really was all that powerful, he sunk. So I kind of wanted to do this with a youth group. Uh, someone, I saw this online. Someone said to just tell all the youth kids to just look at you and to, tell them to fix their eyes on you, that they can blink and stuff. But then they got distractors. They got people, volunteers to distract them, to turn the lights on and off and to start yelling and, and making storm sounds like on a CD or something and to see if the kids would focus you know, be able to look at me without looking at anything else. And that might be hard for kids, but that, I think that might be hard for you guys too. You're pretty ADD, right? No. <laughs> but I feel like that would be hard. But imagine Peter's distractions. He wasn't just sitting in a chair, just has, has to do one thing, just look. But he could feel the wind. He could hear the wind howling. He could feel the waves crashing against the boat. The disciples, they're probably freaking out too. They, they were saying it's a ghost and they were all scared but he still stepped out on that water while keeping his eyes on Jesus while trusting in him. I could just picture in my head Peter saying or Peter asking Jesus to come and then Jesus says come and then Peter's spirit going yes and then his mind going no you can't, you can't walk on water. That's not normal. That's not for humans. But then what does he do? He looks around and sinks. And of course, I want to just tell you guys, don't doubt. 
And that's easy. That's easy to say. But the main point I see in this part of the story is that if you never fail, then you're probably not trying. And that's, that's quite opposite of what I've, I've always thought. You know, I've thought, if you're going to fail, don't do it at all. Or if you don't do it right the first time, don't do it at all. But uh, if, you don't, if you never fail, then you're probably not trying. I really like that. Will you guys say that with me? It's a longer one. But if you never fail, then you're probably not trying. And that's our fifth point. I'm not saying that I want you to fail or I want you guys to doubt, but I want you, your faith to grow. And the only way to grow is to step out in faith. You might think that sinking made Peter's faith weaker, but I think just the opposite. I think he was able to look back on what happened, look at what happened on that lake that morning, and realize that he did walk on the Sea of Galilee. To look back and say, when I had faith, I was walking on water. Next time, I need to fully fix my eyes on Jesus and fully focus on him if I want my faith to last, if I want to stay on that water for longer. And he could look back and see that his, when he had faith, he was walking on the water, and that faith works, but doubt just kills the moment. It takes away from that. And we need to be like the man in the Bible who says, I believe, Lord, help me overcome my unbelief. Because, you know, we do have a lot of lies in our head, a lot of areas of unbelief that we need to overcome. And if we're not trying to overcome them, then we never will. So be working on your doubts and unbelief by asking for that rhema word. And then by stepping out once you have it. Don't just take the rhema word and say, yeah, that would be cool, but it seems scary, so I'm not going to do it. But that's why the military trains for battle. People think that they'll just rise to the occasion sometime. You know, I've thought that before. Like, oh, I'll, I'll have faith when I need it. But no, when bad things happen or when tough times come or when the pressure's on, the truth is that people don't rise up to the, to the occasion. The Navy SEAL said this. Under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. You sink to the level of your training. That's why we train so hard. And I, I like this quote because it all ties together. He says you sink to the level of your training. We're talking about when Peter lost that faith, he sunk. So if we want to increase the faith, we must let it grow. And the way you let it grow is by stepping out and being that holy risk taker. The holy risk taker that says, I've heard your word, Lord, and I'm stepping out in faith because I believe you. I trust that you're going to pull me through. And once we start doing that, God will give us greater reign of words and greater acts of faith. And I like, I like what Pastor Jamie's church is called. It's called greater faith. And it is the Christian life is supposed to be greater and greater. It's not supposed to stay the same or decrease. We're supposed to go from glory to glory. God's always moving and growing us up. And once we have that, we'll be able to have enormous effects on people and impacts on the city around us. And even us as brothers and sisters, we can affect each other and spur each other on to love and good deeds and to do God's will. Luke 16.10 says, One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And so once we're faithful with what God's given us already, He'll entrust us with more. It's like the parable of the man with the talents. And the one man, he just buried them. And then the other people, they invested, they multiplied their talents. And the master took the talents from the man who didn't invest and gave them to the ones that did, the ones who were faithful with what they were given. And so that just shows that once we're faithful with what we have, then we'll get more. And not just for ourselves, but we'll get more to bless others with our faith. So before we judge Peter and sink in, remember that he was the only one willing to step out of the boat that morning. He was the only one. Everyone says how Peter sank, but very rarely do people say that the disciples never left the boat. And that's our sixth point for this morning. Be the one to leave the boat. So say that with me. Be the one to leave the boat. Some of us start out like Peter. We hear Jesus say, don't be afraid. We start walking, but then fear comes rushing in. We get that mixture of fear and faith. 
And when my mom was diagnosed with cancer, immediately fear tried to rush into our hearts. Well, I know my heart. But then I remember that God has power over all things. When we take our eyes off Jesus, though, in those situations, in those tough times, then it's easy to look at the scary situation around us and start thinking about all the bad things that could happen. But we shouldn't doubt that Jesus is all-powerful. We shouldn't have that doubt in our hearts. We need to overcome that. We watched How Great Is Our God. Have you guys seen that video by Louis Giglio? Yeah, the Passion Conference. I think you're talking to me about it, Andrew. Yeah, we watched it uh, with the kids at youth group. And he does a great job just giving perspective on how great and powerful and mighty our God is. He starts out with showing how big the stars are and stuff and how small we really are in our own galaxy and our universe. But then he says that God is a star breather. And so, you know, he's way bigger than we can even... I can't even fathom it, and I know that none of you can. But that's why it's important to remind ourselves, because we, we do get distracted. We do forget. That's why it's important to be in the Word and to be in fellowship with believers, to encourage each other and to remind us. With the situations we face, the truth is that sometimes things are too big or too scary for us to handle on our own, and things you know, we will t- if we handle them on our own, in our own strength, then we might make it worse or we will fail. But that's why we need to fix our eyes on Jesus because nothing is too big for him to handle. So I encourage you guys to be the ones who leave the boat, but leave the boat with that rhema word and fix your eyes on Jesus. And then you'll be able to walk on the water as long as you need. I believe that when Peter was rebuked by Jesus... It wasn't Jesus saying, you stupid idiot, why in the world would you doubt me? You, you were just walking now because you're stupid, you're sinking. I don't think he said anything like close to that. But I believe it was done in love. Sure, Peter got rebuked at times and maybe pretty harshly. But I think it was more like, come on, Peter, why did you doubt? You had faith and now you're sinking. Remember that Jesus is a loving redeemer and he immediately grabbed Peter before he drowned before he sunk. And you know, I was just thinking about that. He didn't just let Peter just teach him a lesson by just letting him just breathe in all this water and then having to do CPR in the boat or anything. <laughs> no, he grabbed him immediately because he did give him the word and Peter did step out in faith. He just needs to work on that faith. And that's what we need to do. The Lord is not going to just let us drown. He's going to pick us up. And so let's look at the last verses, verses 32 and 33. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Well, a lot happened in these two verses. First of all, notice that the storm finally stopped. You think that Jesus would stop the storm before Peter stepped out on the water, but no. It was after Peter stepped out in faith that the storm stopped. A lot of times, if not every time, we need to step out before we see results. Peter stepped out, and then the water got hard. Peter walked on the water, and then the storm stopped. You know, Jesus doesn't, you know, he, that's why it's called faith, because we don't see it, but we know it's going to happen because of Jesus. We know that he's going he's gonna to take care of the rest. And like when people in the Bible had to speak before the magistrates, like you were telling me, about, you know, God didn't give them the words before. I, th- I think he, they went, and then God gave them the words as they're speaking to them. God always says that he would give you the words. He would, he would give you, he would make the water hard before you. So that takes us to our final point, our seventh point, the point of completion, as I was saying. And that is that once we leave the boat, we must risk the ocean. And that's the title of t- today's message. Risk the ocean. Say that with me. Risk the ocean. You know, it's all or nothing. You're like Peter. You have a tunic or whatever you're wearing. Hopefully, you, I don't think anyone's wearing a tunic. But you have whatever you're wearing, and you're, you're stepping out on the water. And you're, maybe people are afraid because they don't know how to swim or anything, or the clothes will drag you down. But that's why it's all or nothing. You have to have faith, and you don't have to worry about 
the wind and the waves, you can take that risk and finally risk the ocean. So if you sink, the Lord is there to catch you. Look at Peter's results. He sunk. But what happened? The disciples saw Jesus use Peter, walk on the water, and it changed their lives. They knew Peter as the plain, clumsy, outspoken fisherman. But when they saw the miraculous, when they saw Jesus use Peter to walk on water, their lives were transformed. They said, surely he is the son of God. And I believe that this is what Jesus wanted, wanted them to realize because he wanted to teach them something because their hearts were hard before. And he wanted to teach them that he really is the son of God. When we step out in faith, we will grow and others will be effective positively as well. Just think of all the good things that comes out of taking spirit-led risk. People's faith can increase. People might be led to worship like the disciples. Or people might even be saved. I believe that if there is non-believers there, that people could be saved. We've been studying Daniel with my dad on Sunday. And we saw what? We saw Nebuchadnezzar. You say Nebi, yeah, King Nebuchadnezzar. We saw him throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace and not be burned up. And then what happened? Because of their faith, the king made a decree to worship their God. And you might say, well, my friends, my family, everyone around me knows my faults. They know the mistakes I make. I can't be used by God. I'm worthless. Or I've talked to people this week, and people were saying how they just, they feel inadequate. And before, you know, speaking, I feel inadequate at times. I feel like there's a lot of people who can speak better than me, but God wants to use you. He wants to, he's put you in a place for a reason, and he doesn't want you to just sit there. He wants to use you for his glory. And it's not true that you're worth this. You're loved by God, and he wants to use you. So what you and I need to do is learn to hear his voice so that we can ask for that rain of word and then step out in faith. Then we'll be a living testimony to those around us. And the people who see us being holy risk takers will finally understand that Jesus is the Lord of lords. And that's going to be a good day. Amen? Amen. We can start now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for just teaching us, just pushing us to be holy risk takers, not people who just don't care and just do random things, or not just daredevils, but people who hear from you, respond to your voice, and just ask for that rhema word, and then step out in faith with their eyes fixed on you, God. I pray that you would just strengthen your body, encourage them. I pray that this didn't discourage them and say, oh, you guys don't take risks. You guys aren't people of faith. I pray that that doesn't, dis- it's not discouraging us, God, but that it encourages us to live for you. As we have a new year in this church building, I pray, God, that we would not just keep it in here, but that we would go out, go out into the highways and byways and go speak to people about your good news. And when you ask us to do something for you in faith, I pray that we would step out and not even think about the storm and the waves, but just look at you, God. And we thank you for this time. I pray that we would take what we've learned here today, take it into our Monday, God, that we wouldn't just keep it here for Sunday, but take it into our week and use it in our lives forever, God. And we thank you, and we love you, Father. You're such a great and awesome God. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.